Welcome back, everybody, to the Pause of That podcast. So if you all remember, in the uh, end of 2017, there was a big, big FOMO story on cryptocurrency. Um, I have a crazy story, which I turned about $16,000 into $181,000 in less than 60 days. And I didn't sell out because I still believed in the long term. Um, I would be that guy that turned 16000 into 180000 cashed out and then it went to you know 10 million so <laughs> i avoided that uh, mental collapse i've had that happen with multiple stocks in my past nice. um you know but i think there's a lot of unknown around cryptocurrency there's mm -hmm. still a lot of unknown so today i wanted to unravel the truth behind cryptocurrency from someone very educated so today i'm happy to have dr sean steinsmith here oh, yeah. as my guest welcome as, welcome <laughs> Coach, thank you for having me yeah i appreciate it so i think um why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, sure. your history, what got you into cryptocurrency, sure. and what happened in 2017. Sure, absolutely. So currently I'm on the faculty at um, uh, Lehman College. And on top of that, I'm also on the advisory board of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, where I chair their accounting working group. I'm on the board of a tech startup in the bookkeeping crypto space. Mm -hmm. And I also just recently wrapped up a fellowship at the AIER, the American Institute for Economic Research. Okay. And so as far as how I got into crypto or into blockchain really mm -hmm. to actually start, I'd say that my background, right, prior to higher ed, I was in financial reporting, right? Half accounting, half IT. And so the whole IT conversation sort of had to get information from point A to point B accurately mm -hmm. and uh, on time, hopefully, okay. right? Um, With integrity. Yeah, absolutely. And all of that was a big part of my roles, right? And I had maybe two or three roles in that space before getting my doctorate and then uh, going into higher ed. Now, as far as what happened in 2017, mm -hmm. I would say that really the whole idea of FOMO is probably the best way to sort of outline that, right? Yeah, I watched it. Right. I mean, absolutely. Right. Because Bitcoin burst out into the scene in 2016. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But it had been sort of out there since 2009. Mm -hmm. Which then, is crazy. Yeah. It's like and, a secret for seven years. Exactly. And then in 2016, 2017, it was like a uh, light switch went on. Right. All of a sudden, there were all these, you know, uh, hedge funds being set up, conferences, panels, magazines, yep. investors, Bloomberg, oh, CNBC, guru. Fox Business, yep. had, had yep. all these talking heads yep. on, right? Yep. Trying to outline crypto, how uh, the future of business was on crypto, right? Accounting, finance, law, markets, it was going to be totally overhauled mm -hmm. overnight. Now, ultimately, that didn't quite happen. The hype got out in front of the market reality. So, so to pause you right there, so sure. I am a big trend momentum guy, right? Absolutely, I can yeah. spot a trend and momentum, yep. probably with the best of them in mm -hmm. the fields that I know, sure. right? So I would post literally like, look, I think Bitcoin's gonna hit 11,000 by tomorrow, it was at 9,500 mm -hmm. and they would hit that. I'm like, look, 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 I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, look, I don't know what this Bitcoin is. I'm not a Bitcoin expert, mm -hmm. I'm not an advisor. All <laughs> I'm telling you is like, everyone's coming to the party late yeah. and they're all having this fear of missing out. Cab and drivers, I also guys. told every single, literally every single person, I, I can't wait to the post comes back up as a memory on Facebook. Mm -hmm. When it hit 19,000, I told everyone, get out and start day trading it once it drops, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, people are always like, oh, well, you told us to buy Bitcoin. I go, yeah, but I told you to buy Bitcoin at 5,500, yeah. at 7,500. Mm -hmm. And I told you to sell it at 19,000, right? In a post. If you didn't follow it or you didn't listen, that's not my fault. But no. if you still got it today, even if you bought it at 5,500 mm -hmm. or 7,500, you're still up over 10% on it. Yeah. More Absolutely. or more than that. You know, yeah. and people, you know, look, at the end of the day, it's always someone else's fault. So the people that bought it late 12, 13, 14, 15, 19,000, they're like, you were wrong. I'm like, no, you didn't listen. Mm -hmm. You chose to, you know, be late to the party because yep. you weren't a believer. And now you came in and you're saying it's my fault. Not my fault. I didn't tell you to buy it. You know, I told <laughs> you what matters. I was doing. Right. Timing matters. Timing matters big. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's go back to that. So sure. at the end of 2017, mm -hmm. craze, run, mm -hmm. shell companies open up, lawsuits. Of course. ICOs. I ICOs. Everyone that has now a token. Yeah. There was a knee-jerk reaction from mm -hmm. the IRS, knee-jerk reaction yep. from the SEC, obviously the federal regulators, mm -hmm. the FBI. What happened in that? And so basically this whole, you know, huge run up in price, right? Spike, right? You know, tulip bubble style. He run up in price. Higher, they said, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in 2017, made a 
big impact, right? Both on the individuals and the institutions who had bought early, right? They sure. all all of those folks were uh, happy, sure. but that also brought in the Tax focus liability. of the you know IRS, the SEC, OFAC, FBI, right? Because all of that attention and, and hype brings in a huge amount of focus, mm-hmm. and so obviously the the pushback that started in 2018 in terms of uh, uh, of the IRS actually suing sure. you know, Coinbase for yeah, the records yeah, yeah. of their top Coinbase twenty thousand holders. I, so I, I had like I don't know, forty or fifty thousand mm-hmm. in Coinbase in tokens. Yeah, they froze. They didn't freeze my account. They sh- you couldn't access my account for ninety days. Like, mm-hmm. and I wasn't selling anyway. Yeah, but like if I wanted to sell, I couldn't even couldn't if I wanted to. Yeah, and and uh, that really points out the whole crypto marketplace. Uh, it's still very new, right? Equity tradings, bond trading, no one was prepared have for this. all kinds of stop losses right, and right. backstops in right. there. Uh, crypto markets don't right, at all, right? You know what's funny? So I compare. I, uh, did you listen to that episode before? Mm-hmm. I compare everything to sports, sure, or my mortgage business life. Okay. since I'm a kid, right? Because yeah. all I know in my life are I, I, sports <laughs> and mortgage business. Like I really, I'm a very simple person, right? <laughs> a simple man. That's it. Like I, and I compare it to what I know. Yeah. So. Just like the financial markets were not prepared for the economic collapse and downturn in 2008, Mm -hmm. you know, inversely, the crypto platforms weren't prepared for the boom. So as quickly as the Lehman Brothers fell, Mm -hmm. the crypto market spiked, spiked, right? And the the platforms weren't prepared for like the overload. So now, now fast forward, now we're in January 2020, right? Over yeah, two yeah, years right. later, yeah. right? My, my storm of my life is now over. I see the sun. It's a light. I'm happy to see light, let alone the sun, you know, these yeah, days. Yeah. Explain to me where we're at. Where are we at in the crypto space right now? Sure. So in the overall sort of crypto space, it's really now sort of a bifurcation happening, right? Uh, Bitcoin is obviously the big headline driver, counts for over half the market. Are you a Bitcoin buyer right now today? Am I a Bitcoin buyer right now today? I would say cautiously yes. Yeah. So, say cautiously, if you, yes. so if you came into $10 million, there's a chance you would allocate some of that money into Bitcoin right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yes. And now, would your model be dollar cost averaging where you buy $100 here, $100 here, $100 here for 12 months? Or would you go in and just buy one Bitcoin for 8000 or whatever it is right yeah, now? Yeah, it's, like it's trading at like 8200 8, 8, 8, I'd say yeah. that ideally I would do it dollar cost averaging you right would. now. Right? Because right? there's because there has been so much price volatility, sure. right? Sure. It, it was down at around you know, 6,000, pumped up briefly to 9,000. Yep. Now it's back around 8,200, yep. 8,500 right now. So I'd say dollar cost mm-hmm. probably right now makes so most same sense. account, same dollar amount every month. So mm-hmm. buy $200 per month every yeah. month and just see where you're at at the end Basically. of the day. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Right. Because the whole point of Bitcoin right now is even though it's called a cryptocurrency, right? For the vast majority of people, 95% mm-hmm. of of holders of Bitcoin are treating it as a investment. Sure. Right. Now we spoke earlier about the SEC now yes. regulating it, mm-hmm. and the SEC deemed it an actual investment, like a stock. Correct. Yeah. Well, it's it deemed it uh, a commodity, a commodity, Bitcoin and Ether, as per the SEC. So they're not stocks like Apple; they're actually commodities like mm-hmm. gold and silver. Yes, as per the SEC. Now, asking some other agencies, they they would have their own views on that. Right, so the SEC calls it a commodity. The IRS calls all crypto property, property, yeah. real property, real property. Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, if if I were to leave here today, mm-hmm. use a Bitcoin to buy some coffee, mm-hmm. I would have to, you know, pay for the coffee, pay any tax on the coffee, and then also pay any uh, tax on the difference in price on the date that I purchased the Bitcoin and now. So, if you buy, I'm giving an example. If you sure. spent a dollar in Bitcoin, mm-hmm. and now that Dollar Bitcoin is, worth is now $2. worth two dollars. You pay all the taxes associated, and then you would actually pay a capital gains yeah. on the appreciation in price. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and now is that specified as like a real estate deal where like if you hold it for a certain time frame, your tax liability is lessened, or no. it's a flat number? No. Uh, so actually, the IRS came out just back during the fall and basically outlined that any transactions involving crypto, whether it's fiat to crypto, crypto to fiat fiat being dollars, mm-hmm. or it's a crypto to crypto, all of those are taxed. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So someone's making a lot of money somewhere. It's not us. <laughs> no, it's not us right <laughs> now. Yeah. 1031 so, basically is out the window. Completely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 100% that's, gone. Wow. So that's huge. No moving forward. Mm-hmm. Now, in your personal opinion, mm-hmm. right? Oh, geez. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. 
Ripple, XRP, mm -hmm. right? Now, I wrote an article, blockchain. Now, again, truthfully, I understand the overall concept sure. of blockchain. I sure. have very smart people. My CTO, Daniel, what's up? We're going to agree to disagree. or you, oh, know, you know, I'm always open to hear your opinion. Um, <laughs> you know that I know what I know, like I spoke about earlier, sure. right? So I believe that like XRP, for example, mm -hmm. in the financial space, like if I go and transfer, because I just had this happen with a client. Okay. He had $110,000 in his Bank of America business account. Okay. He has a Bank of America personal account. Okay, so both both at Bank at of the America, same bank, and they're both li and they're linked. Okay, okay, so they're linked. Yeah, well, obviously both to him. Okay, so and it's at Bank of America, mm -hmm. not Merrill Lynch. No, both at the Bank BOA. of America, liquid cash. Okay, he transferred the money because he's buying a house sure. from his business to his personal. Okay, and the statement showed still processing. We couldn't get the loan cleared to close because a bank, a mortgage company, yeah. an underwriter says, well, these don't show the funds as cleared. And I said, okay, he has cash liquid in his business. Okay. He deposited it into his cash liquid personal, at right? The, at, the at the same bank, bank okay. with the direct transfer. Mm -hmm. And it says processing. And now we can't close on time because of this stupid issue, mm -hmm. right? Back office processing, trade settlements. Now, based on my light research done on Ripple, which is why I put like, I don't know, I, I think I have like, I think I put when everything went up, like I'm going to give an example, $25,000 of made money from sure. my Bitcoin trades into Ripple. Okay. So like really my net net, like all in is like 17,000, whatever sure. it is. Okay. Okay. That's my actual like cost basis, sure. 17,000. Sure. Gotcha. Into Ripple because I'm like, look, if I could send you money immediately and it's cleared immediately, right? That's amazing. It's like, oh my God, this helps my life out, right? Because yeah, yeah, of no, being yeah. in the mortgage business, yes, right? Exactly. Even with a wire. Like, mm -hmm. if I send the wire out, it gets caught in the Fed queue. You have to wait for a Fed mm -hmm. reference number. If you don't hit by 430, it doesn't appear to the next, next day. day. I'm like, what the fuck? What's the point of fucking sending a wire? It can if, take days. Right. Like, days. I don't understand. And it doesn't clear on the weekend, right? <laughs> Now, meanwhile, if I send you a Bitcoin to your wallet, mm -hmm. it's cleared literally instantaneously, yeah. right? Yeah. So what's Ripple? What's mm -hmm. XRP? And they obviously they deal with MoneyGram, I believe. Sure. Yeah. How do you see Ripple impacting the financial sector? Mm -hmm. So basically, the idea behind uh, Ripple was to basically improve SWIFT, right? right? And SWIFT is, is, is how banks transfer money to each other, right. right? And so the whole idea behind Ripple, it was to build out a, a blockchain-based basically payment transfer platform. Mm -hmm. And I guess Ripple was the first blockchain sort of crypto payment company mm -hmm. to actually partner with banks to be brought sort of into the fold to yep. work with the regulators, with the banks to build a platform that was compliant, you know, KYC, AML. They had the, the guy all on all of the major yeah, networks. Yeah, absolutely. And actually he was just uh, at Davos this week. Oh, really? Yeah, doing his, you know, speech. Yep, yep. Yeah, and so and, and so basically the, the idea there was to make uh, processing payments faster, right. instantaneous, right. right? Basic idea. And then XRP in that context mm -hmm. was the token to be used, right, on that network. Now explain that to me how that works, sure. right? So, so a token, yeah. what the hell is a token? Sure, so so a token and a coin are basically the exact same thing, right? So is it like having a quarter or a dollar bill or no? Um, it would depend, right? So if, so if I had a... Uh, blockchain mm -hmm. and I had my Sean tokens mm -hmm. and those Sean tokens could be used on that network in the context That's of that That's a good pickup line at a bar. You go to a girl like, here, here's my token. Come get, come trade it in for my goods, you know? <laughs> yeah, from, from my the, goods and services. Goods and, services. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not claiming it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, but, but so uh, in the context of that ecosystem, that token is the equivalent of cash. Now, so it's not actually cash. It's, it's not the actually, equivalent it's of the cash. equivalent of cash. So it's like in, monopoly money until you cash it in. Essentially, in that ecosystem, yes. It's 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 like uh, airline miles, Dave and Buster's points, points, American Express exactly. points. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so like it's, gamification essentially. Yes, absolutely. But in the case of XRP, mm -hmm. XRP also has value outside. It's it's traded outside of Ripple, right? So it's, it's traded sure. on Coinbase sure. on other platforms like that. But basically, Ripple is the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And on that blockchain, XRP is the gas that makes it run. So where do you see the Ripple market right now as speculative, as investment, as something somebody should have given the features that it could one day assist in the you know forward-looking proactive approach to financing mm -hmm. and money? 
or is it something that's like too soon? Don't even think about it. I would say that if you had if you had had me on eighteen months ago, yeah, I would I, I would have been more bullish on Ripple, right? Right, because Ripple was first to market, mm -hmm. right? But in the last eighteen months, mm -hmm. Swift actually has their own blockchain project underway now. J.P. Morgan has their quorum project, mm -hmm. and they have over 330 banks mm -hmm. signed up with, I believe, something like uh, 68 banks already using a prototype wow. of their blockchain-based payment system. Wow. So really, I would say that you know, Ripple and XRP were mm -hmm. first to market, mm -hmm. have some great uh, advantages, mm -hmm. and, and have the one advantage of actually being used already in the marketplace, well-known. It's more of a household name. Yeah, than, than Quorum right now. But I would say that it that it has a lot of upside for sure. But there is a lot you more do think competition. Ups, yeah. Upside oh, there. absolutely right. Because uh, the the payment processing uh, process right now is awful, horrible. Right for a commercial payment. Everything. Days. Yep. yep. Days can go by. Yep. So if a company, be it Ripple or Swift or or the Quorum uh, blockchain network, it can actually cut those uh, days down to even hours. It's a huge benefit to individuals and companies who are just trying to do business, close deals, all the rest. But now, I'd say Ripple has some upside, but yeah. there is some uh, headwinds coming too. So in your opinion, like a Ripple at 22 cents, whatever it is, right? XRP. XRP, yeah. XRP at 22 cents. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you see going back to its highs of three and a half, four dollars And if so, what would be the catalyst to that? Sure. Or do you see it going to zero and being worthless? See, so in the case of a token or of a coin like mm -hmm. an XRP, right, its true value is not in the price externally. Mm -hmm. Its true value is in how many people or how many companies are actually using it. Right. So, so it's a pretty interesting conversation for the whole crypto market overall, right? Because if a Bitcoin, just for context, is worth $20,000, as a individual, I'm going to be more apt to then hold on to that, of course. right? Versus uh, using it as currency. Mm -hmm. XRP, exact same thing. If the price of that XRP goes up to a hundred dollars, buying it from a uh, from a company level to actually use it to process transactions costs more. So it's almost like an inverse correlation, right? The price and the volume sure. of it being used for its actual purpose seem to be going in opposite directions. So the Price per XRP isn't really the focus right now, I think. The main focus that, that I would argue, just personally, is that the number of banks and suppliers and customers using XRP. But they are still number one in that category, I believe, right? Yes. For yep. that. So like, I know they have a partnership with MoneyGram, yep. right? Yep. Now, it's one of those things that like, I set it and forget it. I told you, and then I like, kind of trade some money around sure. my positions just yeah. to pick up the swings. And of like, course. Whatever. And if I have to hold it, I hold it, and mm -hmm. I'll dollar cost average in yeah. and then get my money out, right? Yep. It's just a typical game of trading stocks yeah. and everything else, right? Mm -hmm. So how does the MoneyGram partnership mm -hmm. in particular impact XRP. So I would say that in the short to medium term, that partnership, assuming that, you know, it uh, all goes well, mm -hmm. that would that would probably have a positive impact on the price per XRP. But for the longer term story, the benefit to Ripple mm -hmm. and the company itself and its blockchain platform is the real story. Right? And from a investment point of view, there are honestly sort of two angles to to take here. One is the direct investment into XRP, mm -hmm. and if Ripple goes public at a certain point, into Ripple directly, mm -hmm. and also into the companies that supply all of the hardware and software for Ripple and for its uh, back office customers. So now, at what point of, uh, let's compare like the dot-com sure. era, oh, geez, right? Yeah. Okay. to crypto right now, right? So you said Bitcoin came out in 2009, mm -hmm. we're 11 years later, yep. right? Um, in my opinion, this is only my opinion. We have IMO. Even, yeah, yeah, IMO. Right? It's kind of a new token. <laughs> yeah. So offering. Yeah, in my offering, <laughs> I believe that even in the dot com concept, domains like domains or digital real estate, mm -hmm. and yep. you know, I, I was on AOL. Like, welcome, you've got mail. Like mm -hmm. in like 1997, course, yeah. six, whenever yeah, it was. Right? Everything, yeah. Yeah. Like my dad caught me on like a dirty website. I got grounded <laughs> for like two years, I think. Right? But anyway, so. We're 25 years later from mm -hmm. when I first signed in to You've Got Mail, and I don't even think people realize the full capacity of e-commerce yet 25 mm -hmm. years later. So if we're 11 years into this Bitcoin and 
you know, 65% of people in household don't have a penny invested into Bitcoin, in my opinion. It's about it's probably it's probably even more than that. Yeah. Sophistication level sure. wise, right? Yeah. Where do you see us in this cycle in comparison to like, you know, the AOLs of the world and how long is it going to be before like mm -hmm. Google now comes, mm -hmm. you know? I, I would say that we're still really early, you know? So if, if I was to compare this to a baseball game, yeah, we're in the second inning that early on still early on well well yeah because uh wow be, because there are people who are quite knowledgeable sure. on this topic but the average person no on the street no has heard of yep. bitcoin yep. Yep. right has heard of bitcoin yep. might have heard of yep. blockchain but but as far as understanding what they are how they work and the applications for it i mean the educational gap is huge and also for the applications right for, like, the first application of blockchain is cryptocurrency right Bitcoin, all the rest, mm -hmm. trading, pricing, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. There are smart contracts, uh, autonomous firms that can run themselves. There are all kinds of, of applications for blockchain by itself. And then also there are applications to combine blockchain with IoT, AI, all, all of these other new tools that are coming out there. So the main thing is that all of us have been focusing so much on blockchain and crypto, but but blockchain and crypto don't happen by themselves at all, right? There's a whole technology ecosystem of automation happening around blockchain that really is the catalyst going forward. Now, dumb down for me and everyone else, I'm sure listening, what is blockchain and what problem does that solve in the world? Sure. So basically what a blockchain is, is it's a decentralized way to store and to transmit data. So define decentralized. Sure. So in a normal context, right? And if I shop at Home Depot this weekend, mm -hmm. right? Home Depot has a huge trove of data on me. Purchase history, credit card history. And and, it, and then if I sign up for a Home Depot card, right? They have all of that data, banking data, address, SSN number. All of my personal data is stored at Home Depot. In their unprotected server. In their unprotected server. Or at Target or at JP Morgan. Anywhere, yeah. You know, a Marriott, Anywhere, yeah. Yahoo, yeah. Facebook. I mean, GMC, yeah, you name it. You know, yeah. Any large company yeah. has this huge amount of, of data on us. Mm -hmm. Why? To market, to market to you. Exactly. To market to us, to advertise to us, and to also process our transactions faster and, and easier. Yeah, get to know your customer, if you will. Exactly. But, a, but a, a blockchain basically says, well, hold on. I don't want to give you all of that data or... Or if a company has to have my information, it should have a, a backup or a backstop, right? Because any data processing platform, mm -hmm. be it Google, be it Amazon, SAP, QuickBooks, whatever, any industry, healthcare system, whatever, um, there's usually one key hub or one sort of key central point. And all of that works good in, in concept, right? But, but having all of that data in one spot is basically the same thing as having your house, right? Mm -hmm. Having a foyer mm -hmm. and then having in that foyer a map of your house and on that map, a giant red X pointing to where all of your valuable stuff is. Sure. Passports, jewelry, Everything. cash. And so any uh, robber coming in opens your front door, is is in your foyer, has that map right there and says, oh, great. Yeah, take what you want. All, all of that data is right there. I know exactly where it is. And so a blockchain basically tries to break up that record of information so that even if one server goes down yeah. since everybody has the up-to-date record of all of that information the processing of data uh, happens still so do you believe blockchain is built for every single industry or are there are certain industries that have more interesting you know implementation of it sure so what i would say there is that it's it's more important to focus on the actual business use case mm -hmm. Right, because not every business use case. Oh, or your business... bodega is not going to want it. Your little no. corner store no. or whatever. No, or or a industry where there's you know, customized service per per customer or per company, right? But for a a industry or for a business problem where there's a high volume mm -hmm. of transactions that happen over and and over again, AP, AR, onboarding, any of those processes where the process happens the exact same way. The, the individuals or the payment dollars could change, but the process happens over and over again. Insurance, healthcare, accounting, trading, banking, all of those uh, processes that happen basically over and over again are prime candidates. But I would say that 
it's more important to focus on having the business problem first versus the industry. Now, we spoke earlier about, as we get to know each other, we sure. always like have my like, little meet and greet, yeah, we yeah. chop it up, kick exactly. it out, whatever, you know, steal each other out. Yeah. So you spoke about blockchain and real estate, mm -hmm. right? And how, like, let's say, for example, you know, landlords are looking to cash out. They're actually creating a blockchain platform with crypto and tokens behind mm -hmm. a specific building mm -hmm. to do so. Do you want to walk us through how that would look visually for people? Sure. So, so basically, the best way to sort of picture it is almost picture like a timeshare concept, mm -hmm. but different. So, so if I had a building, it's worth $10 million and I want to issue 100 million tokens, mm -hmm. right? So I, so I have the blockchain, call my lawyer, work with them, hire the developer, do it all on the up and up. What's something like that cost? It would depend uh, on, the on the project. On yeah. the project. Um, and so I had that all done mm -hmm. and it's all, you know, I's are dotted, T's are crossed, all the rest. Mm -hmm. Then I issue those tokens out to the marketplace. And so basically I say each token is worth one, one, uh, 10 cents, whatever. one hundredth yeah, 100, of the yeah. building. Yep. And so the, yeah, and so then I'd price it at 10 cents, whatever, a dollar each. And so then depending on how many tokens a individual or a firm buys above that building, mm -hmm. then those uh, token holders um, can either share in the profits and losses of the building, can have a say in the Mandarin of the building, or can have certain perks, right? Access. So it's kind of like crowdfunding, essentially. It's basically like crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding. Yeah. So it's crowdfunding using a blockchain. Now, why would somebody do blockchain, right? And not just go to a crowdfunding platform and open up an LLC, you buy mm -hmm. into the shares. Like why would somebody uh, lean more towards blockchain opposed to doing it the other way? Sure. So, I mean, the, the two, the two sub biggest reasons right now is one optics, right? Your blockchain, cool. your, your tokenized yeah, yeah. real cool, estate, you know, yeah. it's cutting yeah, edge, yeah, yeah. tokenized yeah. real estate, all the rest. Yeah. And then two, I mean, there are individuals that, that do like the idea of a blockchain of a, of a crypto asset right so they're not tethered to the fiat system not not having to use a bank mm -hmm. or a third party mm -hmm. or a payment processor to actually custody uh their assets and their data so if somebody has a building on blockchain they could obviously then collect their rent in token bitcoin tokens, absolutely right? yeah yes and so, then they basically control the economy for that yes and so then basically that that building or that uh commercial property becomes its own tokenized ecosystem Right, there are tokens issued for for rights to access the building for the gym, for the you know hot tub, you know for the arcade, or to actually use certain areas of the building, or uh, more more basically to actually share in the profits of that building. Now let's talk about obviously the money laundering and black market. Oh sure, of perception course. of this. Of course, it always comes up. It must, right? And I think that's the way people. I always say, like, when people don't understand something, they always knock it and try and scare people out of it. Of course, not right or wrong. I have no opinion on either. I just think like you, people should that's shut default. Their, yeah, people should shut their mouth until they actually know what they're talking about. That's my opinion, unless you have proof of it. Like, hey, ideally, just, this guy just wired two hundred million from uh, <laughs> Mexico and drug cartel. Like, mm -hmm. unless you saw that happen and you know that happened, like, don't just say it happened, right? Yeah. So, is it true that? Bitcoin in particular and mm -hmm. other, you know, cryptocurrencies have been a home for the black market and money laundering. So to proven. So to pivot that question, I'd say, um, or the question I would ask is, what's the most commonly used asset for all criminal actions? Money I would laundering. say cash and jewelry. U.S. dollars. Yeah, cash. Yeah. Right. So any asset or currency, be it Bitcoin or cash, can be used for bad activities. Anything. Activities. Can be. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. But uh, Bitcoin sort of came to the forefront because of the Silk Road incident, right? Which is basically, or it was a a, a dark web website where you know, drug dealers, criminals, all, all kinds of bad. And that's people. true. This is all confirmed. Yes, yeah, absolutely true. The the person who was in charge of it is currently in uh, prison. Who is it? Ross Ehrlicht. Okay. I, I believe that's how. What's this guy's background? Uh, his background was he was a you know programmer, coder, stand up developer. guy, good family man. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that because yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. But but basically, uh, his whole thing was was that if people want to buy something or to do transactions for certain goods or services, mm -hmm. they should be able to do so. Now, obviously, the FBI took a. Basically, saying if I want to pay for prostitution or buy illegal guns or I buy be, a kilo I should, of coke, I should have the right to do that, and I could do it over this crypto platform. Dark web, yeah, yeah, and and so obviously then the uh, FBI busted him. That happened and, in America. Yes, and 
as it turns out, a few uh, a few agents on the case actually then, after the fact, were actually arrested for trying to embezzle some of the seized Bitcoin. FBI agents. Yes. Serious. Yeah. Well, they're always corrupt, as I'm sure. Right? Well, I mean, yeah. but so I feel like they were kind of like corruption. Uh, here's and what I feel like, anywhere. right? Like anything. Yeah, you're right. So I feel like the FBI, you're either getting a hundred percent like militant, like by the book, <laughs> like tough guy, bald head, rip your balls off, right? <laughs> or you're getting that like really criminal person that's hiding behind. <laughs> yeah, I work for the FBI. I'm like, yo, you're as dirty as it comes, you know? Like, same with police officers, right? You get the really, really great guys and then you get all the shit bags, right? So like you kind of have like very, you know, divide and conquer oh, mentality. And that's, that's anywhere, obviously. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, any, that's any industry, any, any industry, industry it's, human. Anywhere. it's human nature. Pre- pre- um, they are always going to be good actors <laughs> and some bad apples, yeah. right? In any industry. But these agents actually tried stealing the crypto that yes. they got? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And and actually from a, from like a, uh, AML point of view, the FBI loves Bitcoin, right? Because, right? Because I know which address has which a Bitcoin. All of that data is public. It's public on the, data. It's on the public blockchain, right? So every transaction, every Bitcoin is in a public wallet somewhere. Unless you move it off into private. Yeah, storage. off into a, a private chain. And so then, but but most folks aren't there yet. But so I can trace the the transactions of every single Bitcoin to a, a public wallet tagged to a IP address. You know, it's so funny. I can trace everything. So when I tell you, like, I'm so technology stupid, like <laughs> even with like, look, I'm going to social media because it's yeah. easy. I've simplified right it, right? Like, hey, like hey, Instagram guys. post. <laughs> yeah, like, all right, we can post, we can tag. Sure. Like, I've just recently added the feature where if I post to Instagram and automatically goes to uh, Facebook wow, now. I'm like, oh, this saves me about seven seconds, <laughs> 10 times a day. I'm cool here, yeah, right? Yeah. A minute, minute, it saves sure. my life. But so I can only buy like Tron, I think extra paid the time on like Binance, right? Yep. So yep. about Binance, I have an email, I put everything in, two-step authentication. Well, then I get rid of that email. My email on Gmail gets full. I don't log into it. I'm like, well, I can see the price on it. I'm not you know, trading it. I'm just sure. gonna leave this kind of here, right? Part of the reason why I never sold out when it went to 180, aside, or even took a piece out was, sure. I couldn't figure out how to like log you in. Couldn't get like, in. It was that much of a pain <laughs> in the balls, right? So now, a year goes by. I'm like, let me just log into Binance. Like, let me just see what, let me make sure, first of all, my money's still in there, yeah, right? Well, yeah, obviously. So I go to log in. It's like, uh, um, your email is not the correct email. I'm like, all right, well, text me a code. It sends me a code. So I put it in like, all right, two-step authentication. So I go to support and yeah. I'm like, all right, well, I, need, I don't have this email anymore. Here's who I am. Here's my Google, my IP address, whatever sure. it is. They sent me a list of 25 things I had to do. Everything from like, Driver's license, front and back, hold it up, take a selfie, yeah, yeah. send the video, say your name, say you authorized me, tell me your new email, like send me a nude. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> like, how hard is this to like get my, uh, this is my account. Like, yeah. look, I put all the information in, like, I'm sorry, but like, I don't use this email anymore. Mm-hmm. Here's my updated email. So do you think they've gone above and beyond protection security wise, truthfully? I, I, I would say that they've become much more like a uh, bank right now. I, right? I feel worse. Right? No. Well, well, because uh, uh, Coinbase was sued by the IRS and Binance, I believe in May, was was hacked. Yeah, they I heard were, something happened. Well, with their, their, um, their hot wallet was hacked and I believe $40.5 million was uh, Gone. stolen. Gone. And so, yeah, I mean, obviously these platforms are trying to up their game sure, in terms sure. of making well, sure have, that confirm. the that yeah. the uh, individual trying to access funds are actually those individuals. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, they've been – so probably to start off, they were kind of lax. Yeah. But over the last 18 months, they've yep. been uh, on the upswing. Now, when new tokens or concepts or ICOs come to market, right, mm-hmm. how do you suggest somebody – analyze them does their research what tips would you give to people that are interested in the field and want to learn sure. but maybe want to invest maybe want to just you know buy into a concept or be a part of a community what sure. would your advice be in doing due diligence sure so the absolute first step that i would take is to uh never invest money you can't lose Right, obviously. Where were you 15 years ago? Yeah, you know. <laughs> I could have got that tattooed on me. <laughs> I was in high school. Like all my other phrases. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then afterwards, you know, uh, so... I, I was in high school too. Yeah, right? right. So, <laughs> right. so ICOs are kind of out of the picture right now, right? Because there were, I believe there was a stat where like 90% of them turned out to be frauds. Yeah. Or, yeah. or flops or just yeah, pulled it down. Some iced tea company opened up, right? In like yeah. Long Island. like Riot blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Iced tea blockchain. Whatever. Yeah, all that bullshit. was ridiculous. Watching that was that, great. Watching that spike, it was absurd. 
<laughs> SEC is now, you know. Oh, asking yeah, they're recouping that. everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they're asking questions. That's yeah, not all they're, they're yeah, doing. No. Asking questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, In a detention center. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, so for an, an ICO or an STO or a token offering, first steps is to always do your background on the management team, right? Look them up, Google them, try and see their own backgrounds, right? Their own experience in the field. Do they have any? Right. Uh, first step. Step two, go over the white paper. Every coin, every token has a white paper outlining their their blockchain, their token, their business case, sort of their own narrative for for how the token works, what they you know envision it to be. And then three, analyze the actual business, right? Because not every yeah, there has to be a business model behind right, your right, token, I mean, right? Yeah, just yeah, like this is, just this like is business news here, guys. Yeah. There there has to be an actual business underpinning the 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 token. So probably a a prime example of of a ICO which did not do this was uh was Kick. So Kick K I K. It was the first sort of big name ICO here in 2017 raised 100 million dollars. And they had tokens issued and you know whatever had the ICO legally the, legitimately everything. Well at kind the time, of legally yeah, yeah legally yeah. illegally gray area stuff, right? And so they had the ICO, had the tokens issued, raised it all good. Then it turns out, after the fact, when their price per token plunged, SEC came in asking questions, and it turns out they had issued the tokens, and in their white paper, in their marketing stuff, they they had said that their their whole business model, their their business platform was done. Turns out it was not done yet, and so basically they used the embellishment hundred million in those marketing documents to raise the hundred million dollars. And then it turns out they weren't able to have it done on time. And the SEC filed, I believe it's called a Wells notice back in June, basically asking them questions. Now they're all all over them, basically. Here's where I, th I feel a problem is, though. Again, I experienced it firsthand in the mortgage business. These regulators that come in, half of them probably don't even have mortgages. Mm -hmm. Half of them never at, even sat in the loan origination process, mm -hmm. right? And they're judging and criticizing, right? Mm -hmm. They only know what they've read in a book or what the sure. superior told them. So now with the SEC, like you have Dr. Sean Steinsmith, <laughs> right? Who's, Me. Yeah. <laughs> who's never known anything about Bitcoin or crypto. His son probably has a couple dollars in Bitcoin because <laughs> his buddy's cool and they're mining. Yeah. Coming in and like coming out with questions on regulatory that's not really even established. So like, how do you prevent that knee jerk reaction? And how do you shift from like, hey, you're being interrogated to, hey, I'm just trying to figure out what the hell went on here. Sure. So and I'm sure fraud's easy to detect in this based on bank records. Yeah. And I'd say that if you had asked me that 18 months ago, 24 yeah. months ago, yeah. I would say that the SEC, the IRS, the oversight bodies were a bit behind. But really Way behind, I, but sure. but all of them have been doing a tremendous level of work. I'm sure they have to, their own task force now, to right? to catch up and to try to get knowledgeable and to work with companies to get a better handle on on how this stuff works. So I mean, having conversations now at the SEC, at the IRS, Treasury, FBI, OFAC, the whole yeah. the, the the whole, whole gamut, gang, yeah. yeah, the whole gamut, the I mean, whole gang. I mean, yeah. I mean, those those agencies Crypto are gang. are much more up to speed now, and so as a byproduct of that they're asking harder questions, mm -hmm. but they're also more open to having a, a conversation to work with you. If you or a client of yours is having a visit from the SEC, for example, they, they are more open to having that dialogue to try to work with you. And if, if you or your, uh, your counsel can go through, you know, walk through what happened, why the reasons why things happened were good, bad, and ugly, and just you know tell them they what made happened a decision and, go, and why. Yep. I mean that that is probably the best way to go about it. So, in your opinion, can a token work in the right community? Absolutely. I Definitely. mean, uh, yeah, because basically all that a token is, it could be tokenized real estate. It could be a token for a website, a game site, uh, the. Uh, Brave Browser mm -hmm. has its own tokens, mm -hmm. BAT tokens, basic attention tokens, right? It's basically a online search portal based on blockchain and it has tokens. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there is a market for it. Now, as far as it's going like totally mainstream for everything, no, right? But there is definitely a market or a niche market for now in that sort of you know, tokenized way to do business and to access services. From a real estate standpoint, mm -hmm. 
do you believe we're going to start to see more people buying and selling real estate with the blockchain and Bitcoin or no? I would say that as far as buying real estate and if selling it on a blockchain, yes. Because it's probably one of the first sort of mainstream use cases I'm seeing starting to get up and running is to put, you know, title records, property records, you know, tax lien data case. on a blockchain yep. to help sort of. And that eliminates the title company. Now exactly. It's all protected. To help move the process forward. And, to and you're the seeing people process. proactively moving They're, forward yes. with that. Yep. But what are, some com- what are some companies in that space to watch out for right now? Sure. I would say probably the the top one, right? The, the top blockchain yep. company, right? Because. Yep. I'm always hesitant to actually name actual companies out there, yeah. but the top blockchain platform that that's based on basically basically trying to simplify all this, mm-hmm. Factum, F A C T O M. Their whole blockchain model is based around trying to make wills, contracts, uh, any sort of real estate transactions easier to process faster. So there's no gray area. Essentially, it's black and white. Here's what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think we'll come to a point where every single human has their own blockchain profile, kind of like a Facebook profile, <laughs> right? Um, so that's a, Medical records, that's a very interesting social, question, credit right? history, everything. Right, because on the surface, th- that's a fantastic idea, right? Mm-hmm. A self-sovereign ID, right? right? So I have all right. of my data on a, on a yep. blockchain. Yep. But what happens if you have your data on that blockchain and that blockchain in your country is controlled by a government who turns hostile. Gotcha. Then all of your data, your your entire wiped life, out. yeah, is wiped, wiped out, out or controlled, yeah. captured from you. So, so there is that balance. So we kind of have that now, sure. though, with social security numbers, credit reports, bank account records, sure, you know, but, life insurance policies. Yeah. they have that anyway if they really want it, right? Yeah, they 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 have that anyway if they really want to. But to put everything on a blockchain controlled by like the U.S. government. Yep for all of its people living here to have their data on the US blockchain. Sure. Right. Then then there is that opportunity to basically make it like a, you know, a key turn possibility. If the government turns hostile on me, on you, on anybody Whoever. to automatically automatically basically trap us like that. So on the one hand, absolutely mm-hmm. to have all of your data there, medical data, real estate, education. Yep. All yeah. that good stuff. Death wishes. Yeah, your death wishes, whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. 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 yeah, Organ donor yeah. status, whatever. Wolves. Yeah, <laughs> but, there, but there is always that sort of cautionary tale. Gotcha. Awesome. So as we close up the episode, we sure. always leave the listeners with one thing to deposit to their memory bank. So it could be business-related, crypto-related, life-related, based on your personal experience. Sure. What's one thing you want every listener to implement into their daily, weekly, or you know, annual life schedule? Sure. So I'd say if there was one thing, I would say that blockchain and crypto is still... Uh, at the first inning, second inning, and that the only way for all of us to really keep up to date and to have it operate as advertised is to build that educational aspect, right? That that's a learning aspect of blockchain, of crypto, and its applications into our daily lives. You know, read, podcast, all the rest, but to build that education into everything else that you're doing. I appreciate that. So, Sean, thank you for taking my people to school. Absolutely. Uh, crypto school, <laughs> crypto craze. And we look forward to having you back on the show in the future. And Absolutely. in the meantime, if you have any updates or anything, you know, that is relevant to share, sure. please send me those emails and text messages. And I'd yep. be happy to upload it to everybody. So thank you for coming on the show. Look forward to having you back. All right, Jeff. Thank you so appreciate much. Appreciate it.